if you have all these single feature vendors and they all do incredibly well, and there's this beautiful Gen AI like interface on the top of it, you can just talk to the Gen AI interface and the Gen AI will figure out, hey, what is the person actually wanting? Oh, that's actually this feature. Let me just hook it up and it'll, you, you don't need a hundred different interface because that's what you might get if you mm -hmm. have a hundred single vendors with very tiny features. Then you can just create your entire own interface for your platform, for your organization, where everything is covered under for marketing, for sales and, and whoever works in between yeah, those teams. What's up everyone, and today we have the pleasure of sitting down with Rudger Katz, GTM operations consultant. Rudger started his career in neuroscience as a virtual reality developer at two different public research universities to study bodily illusions in VR. But as the VR industry was quite immature at the time, he pivoted to Martech Consulting, where he would spend 12 years working with different technology consulting firms getting a breath of experience across marketing ops, MarTech, customer data, and go-to-market across a variety of clients, including Unilever, where he focused on social analytics. And last year, Rudger decided to go out on his own as a GTM operations consultant and recently launched Neon Triforce, a boutique consultancy focused on optimizing GTM for B2B scale-ups. And he also recently joined the MarTech Weekly as a content lead for EU and the UK, organizing their first event in London. Rugger, thanks so much for your time today. Really pumped to chat. Thank you for having me, Phil. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, Rugger, I love marketing and process theory as much as the next guy, but I'd love to spend an hour with you on like um, these practical use case for. Um, I know that you're a big fan of lean marketing methodologies, and so... I yeah. want the listeners to be able to apply, uh, you know, potential improvements in their day-to-day -day processes. And I know this is a, an area that's really close to your heart. So I'm, I'm planning on playing a bit more of the grumpy devil's advocate uh, in this episode. And hopefully you can convince me and, uh, and some other folks that are, are listening of the value of lean and how it kind of looks like in, in practicality. So maybe we can start with just the definition as i understand it lean methodology in the context of marketing is about hitting marketing goals efficiently and identifying the most valuable activities and strategies and then optimizing those things um so i guess my first question is can you help me cut through the fluff and like the enterprise speak here because i don't know any marketing team that isn't in favor of hitting goals efficiently. Like what does lean marketing actually look like in practice when you do this with clients? How do you go about like going beyond like how to be efficient and really focus on what drives the most value? Yeah, of course. I mean, lean marketing focuses on eliminating waste and amplifying what truly drives value. So whenever you, you, every organization that started as a scale up and, and has grown into an enterprise, has their own processes, right? They, they've started somewhere and it's sort of transitioned into what it was right now. And for every single, I think almost every single organization you can find inefficiencies in the process because this is how we have already always done it, or this is how we've learned it from this tool, or this is how we've learned from this individual. And it, not, it might not necessarily be the best process for what they're trying to achieve. I mean, every organization, every marketing organization is trying to convert customers or send customers to sales or send customers to try the product um, or, you know, with branding, put the awareness of the product of the organization in people's heads. And what Lean does is just, it tries to optimize, perfect the processes in getting the value from the customers or getting the value towards the customers out there. Um, so Lean is very metric, metric driven. It focuses on the KPIs that are tied, in this case, to revenue, right? I've seen a lot of marketing organizations that have metrics which are focused on the campaigns individually, or they're focused on page landings, page views, on uh, social media follows. But uh, the entire goal of Lean is, okay, how does that actually affect the entirety of the organization, not just the marketing department? So to follow up with that, um, Lean is something that you would want to apply to the entirety of the go-to-market. So it looks across sales, customer success, and even product in ensuring that your customer gains the best value of your organization, but also that you give that value as efficiently as possible, that you please the customer as efficiently as possible getting that higher customer satisfaction 
which ensures that customers keep coming back to you or at least stay with your product for a longer period of time. Is that enough fluff cut, out, cut away? <laughs> <laughs> Is there still some fluff in there? I've been a consultant for 12 years, right? So <laughs> it's like my wife says, you're such a talker. <laughs> no, no, it, it's helpful. So like there's, there, there's, yeah, like you said, there, there's still some like buzzwords, I guess, like in the consulting world and, and marketing, like we're all fans of uh, buzzwords and, and a bit more like fluffy terms. Like you said, optimizing your processes, like enabling people to continuously improve, finding blockers and bottlenecks when KPIs are down. Like I get this, like it, they're like kind of fluffy in a sense because like all of these things are obvious and like plenty of teams do this. Like I don't feel the need to call this like lean methodologies when I'm like trying to figure out why a KPI is down and like I'm trying to make a process more efficient, right? But yeah. maybe it'd be helpful if you can like share real world examples where, you know, marketing ops team or a CMO has hired you and you use these principles to fix like a big inefficiency. I'd be curious to hear like what the steps were and like what the end result was. Yeah. So in, in exploring this, you know, I've, I've, I've started working with a couple of CMOs and what they, one, one of the things that they, I, I've asked them, right, what, what is your biggest pain point around uh, processes or this or that? And usually people would say, you know, everything's fine. Everything is perfect. I mean, we know we, we can improve and we are improving. In the first conversation, it's always sort of looking forward for that, that, that first little spot of, hey, this is actually an indicator of mm -hmm. there's something more. Yeah, yeah. And, um, for me, the conversation usually went to, Hey, how's it, how's collaboration actually with sales? And I've had a conversation where they said, well, they've sales actually asked us to slow down with the amount of leads because they just couldn't, you know, deal with the amount of leads that we had. And another one said, yeah, we have discussions with sales. I mean, yeah, we're trying to collaborate easier or better, but uh, it's, it's, it's a little back and forth. It's like these come, these, you know, that. These are the pain points that people usually have. It's when you've got the handover moment between marketing and sales, when you are trying to you know, deliver what sales wants, when they have you know, the right SQLs, which are actual SQLs instead of you know, what marketing defines as SQLs. So in this conversation, what I did is you know, taking a step back from just a marketing process, look at sales first, because that's further down the line. They sometimes have a certain limitation. They also have certain expectation. Like sales is very metric driven, very metric oriented as well. They have a certain amount of leads that they need to convert and they, they are trying to optimize it as best as possible. Marketing opposed to that is often a bit more chaotic. We are running campaigns, we're running events and we, we mission mosh and sometimes sales yells at us as, hey, we need leads now. So we, we sort of throw out the campaign to sort of <laughs> cover that immediate need and the campaign will be good because, you know, we're, we're trying to force something out there. We're trying to, to throw something together and you, you know, it will be good. So what we do is we look at, okay, sales, what is your capacity? How many leads can you actually convert and how can you, um, and how, and, and what's your target? Let's say, let, let's say that, uh, sales needs to convert a hundred leads a month. And we know that our conversion rate is, you know, 5%. So we know that we need at least 20 times that amount of number of leads, SQL leads going to them month by month. And ideally you want to have that as optimized as possible, right? We know that uh, Justin Norris shared this lately. Um, when you pick up your hand raisers within the first 10 minutes or something, conversion rate increases by 40%. So if you can get sales and marketing to collaborate in such a way that we you know when sales drops by uh, a good SQL, a good hand raiser, that sales can pick it up within uh, 10 minutes, you have you know a, an incredible business case already right there for the 40%. Increase conversion rate is quite a lot. So by looking at the capacity of sales would work, work your way back. Okay. How many leads do we actually need to deliver? How, what do we see in our campaigns? Which campaigns are the most effective in delivering, um, quality, high quality leads, the sales that convert well, because not every campaign converts equally, equally well downstream. So it's also looking at, Hey, which campaigns are actually, you know, working the best with sales. And then you sort of progress and, hey, actually we're, we're running a couple of campaigns, which are okay. I mean, they're giving us leads, but actually if you look at the metrics, we're paying way too much money 
to get these leads in and they're, you know, the, the cost, the, the cost of acquisition payback time is it's over three years or four years. It, it could be, I know search, Google search accounts are incredibly, sorry, Google paid accounts are incredibly inefficient in that way, but they're still used a lot, especially in enterprises. Yeah, no, these are super helpful examples. Um, though, those sound like fun, fun projects. I, I love a good sales and marketing misalignment <laughs> case study. I've been part of plenty of, uh, more of your first example where like sales couldn't keep up with the volume of leads for marketing. Um, yeah. for me, it was always like one or two things. Like there's, um, either a lead quality problem, marketing sent way too many shitty leads over to sales. Or two, like there was a resourcing or performance problem on sales. Yeah. But in both cases, it, it almost feels like it was because marketing and sales didn't communicate well. There wasn't a shared yeah. understanding of what the ICP is, if sales only wants to talk to hand raisers, or if they also want to chat with leads that are super engaged, that just need a nudge. Like there was always a healthy conversation about tooling also though, like automation mm -hmm. tools to improve efficiencies. Um, you know, that's where like, uh, especially in the world of like the, this alignment piece, like booking demos and stuff like routing and calendar tools, like revenue hero sponsor of the show uh, really come into like make this incredibly effortless for sales. But yeah, the, mm -hmm. the tooling conversation with lean is, is really interesting because I think a lean tech stack, like avoiding the eventual Franken stack, if you will, is <laughs> is the best way to see lean in the wild. Um, and maybe that's like a good, like, good, like practical way to, to, to look at it. Like one example for me, um, that I seen at a recent company that I'm working with, um, like CS is using intercom as their customer database. Uh, marketing mm -hmm. is using segment as their CDP, but the data team without communicating this well uh, are building a big project in snowflake as a data warehouse. And so there would be massive cost savings if everyone in the company used Snowflake and like something mm. like Census as the reverse detail to push that data. Yeah. So like I've consulted with and worked at companies where there was like a clear overlap in tooling. And I'm sure you've seen this too. But like as much as the end product of like consolidating and like having a really nice lean MarTech stack, like it seems amazing and more cost effective, obviously, but the path to get there is filled with resistance. And frankly, like migration projects that I'm sure you've been part of are often like massive yeah. endeavors and they detract people from current priorities that are probably driving revenue. Like how do you make this case internally as a consultant or even in-house? It's, you know, the thing is with technology, it's even more political than something like a, a marketing or a sales, you know, yeah, in the in between that. Because you've got IT stakeholders, you've got marketing VPs, you've got the CFO, the CTO, all with their own vision. Yeah. And then you have the IT department that would love to create their own iteration of what they think is <laughs> yeah. the ideal technology version of, you know, the, the, the Franken stack, what you mentioned. So, um, the, the challenge with this, I would say is, you know, going towards a lean technology stack requires so much alignment in, in, in larger enterprises. It is incredibly challenging to do. With smaller enterprises, you can easily say, hey, we're looking at, you know, uh, capability overlap. We're looking at feature overlap. And we know that there's like 60% feature overlap in the usual technology stack. Some of it is by design because a certain feature from one product is better than the feature of another product that you're actively using or which is your primary um, tool in, in, in that capability. So... The, 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 the real solution in this is getting your entirety of the organization aligned to look at your technology stack as strategically as possible. I've tried doing this in a couple of times with my clients and those, those were enterprise clients and it just took ages and ages because it's a long-term project to get a, a good technology stack right, right? Um, the thing you can do is, you know, look at it as lean as possible and try to sort of scale down on the capabilities that have a really big overlap, like the ones that, that have like a 90% overlap or something like that. And of course you have shadow IT as well, where people don't actually know what people are using in the entirety of the organization, which could be like 30 or, or, or even more percent of the technology stack could be in shadow IT. Especially with marketing saying, hey, yeah, IT, it's all fun and games, but we've got something that's quicker, that's faster, and I don't know, sales does <laughs> the exact same thing. Yeah, but we want a solution now, so we just bought it and, you know, uh, 
the CMO okayed it or the CRO okayed it. So good <laughs> luck with that. <laughs> no, but in, in, if I would really want to try and fix it, I would start with small steps, you know, tackle the highest redundancies first and then sort of start scaling the migration step and in getting rid of the bigger technology debt, which is, which is always, you know, the biggest pain point in insurance and, and banking organizations that have a lot of old, old systems. You, th there's this theory of constraints within lean where you try and utilize and exploit the bottleneck or an older system as much as possible as you can. And you sort of, you try to work around everything that that's new and, and start replacing it while keeping the old monster or, or whatever it is alive. I'm not entirely sure how well it, it applies to tech debt, but my approach would be, okay, let's just calculate the cost of maintaining or exploiting or utilizing the old solution as much as possible versus the total cost of migration for including the resources and the time spent away from innovation. Um, you know, who knows, we might have an AI tool that's coming up soon. That's even cheaper and faster in doing the migration because in theory, it's just looking at data in a structured way and, and retranslating it in a newer way in the same right. way the processes, right? We, we see that with the speed of Gen AI, it really caught almost everyone off guard in, wow, within one year, all our creative jobs are gone, save the podcasters, of course, for now, <laughs> but you know, we'll see similar things because it's, it's just pattern recognition. It's reading processes, it's reading, you know, data, and it's not a hard job to do for AI. For, for right now, if people say we have a large tech debt, I would say try and work around it as much as possible and explore solutions which are sort of speeding up the migration process. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting topic. Like there's so many jumping off points there. Like on, is AI gonna be able to replace migration projects? It's like being part of so many of these myself, like the thing that makes them unique and interesting is that like every company is different and every team has preferences and even though they have like this big platform like everyone uses the platform differently and like maybe they don't use all the features they just use this thing and so it'd be so hard for ai to come in and see like how this one company is utilizing this platform how is the data structured what are the integrations on the back end and how do we like convert that to like this other tool but like it, the one thing that you said there that I totally echoed with in, in like similar topic is like platforms aren't built to like let you just use what you need. And like that's what makes lean with like tech stacks really hard. Like platforms yeah. kind of lock you in and they have like 750 features, but you bought them for like the 13 features that you really need, it, right? I know, me, I know. For me, this is like the greatest argument for a composable MarTech stack and, and a topic that I've yeah. dived into in like countless times on the show, including when we had uh, Scott Brinker on, like instead of buying a big platform and being locked mm -hmm. in for like three years and uh, like utilizing only 20% of the platform capabilities, it, it is more work and it is more complex and you need to have a great relationship with your data and engineering teams. But this idea of utilizing point solutions instead of yeah. platforms point solutions that do like only a few things, but they do it so well. They have a full team of dedicated engineers that are building a product for just those few things. And you aren't locked in for like several years. You only end up building for what you currently need. And you still have the flexibility to like add on new things, like a new Gen AI tool comes on, you add it on top of the stack. You don't have to wait for the platform to come out with it in like five years. <laughs> what are your thoughts on composability in the context of like marketing and lean? So I, I'm a big fan of, you know, getting what, what I then call feature as a surface instead of software as a surface, right? Yeah. We, we slim down solutions as much as possible and we try to ensure that they're as integrated as possible because that's the most important point, right? That, that everything has a, almost a standardized API that it, it is just an easiest plug and play and you know, if you, if you ship your individual features, you can get incredible lean tech stacks. If vendors do only that. And we already see it with, we see smaller tech companies, uh, especially with Gen AI, making it so easy to build things, to run a company. We see bootstrap companies, you know, doing incredibly well with only five people, you know, a couple of people in, 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 uh, programming, someone in marketing, someone in ops, and, and that's about it. Um, and now. 
if you have, like, this is my ideal future, right? So let me rant for a little bit. If you have like all these single feature vendors and they all do incredibly well, and there's this beautiful Gen AI like interface on the top of it, you can just sort of talk to the Gen AI interface and the Gen AI will figure out, hey, what is the person actually wanting? Oh, that's actually this feature. Let me just you know, uh, hook it up and, and, and it'll, you, you don't need, a hundred different interfaces because that's what you might get if you have mm -hmm. like a hundred uh, uh, single vendors with very tiny features. Um, and then, then you can just sort of create your entire own interface for your platform, for your organization, where everything is sort of covered under for marketing, for sales, and, and whoever works in between, um, yeah, those teams. Um, that was my idea. But that I is think super I, interesting. I, I, diverted, I diverted, I think, from your question. No, but no, no. It, it's it's a super fun topic. So, like, it, it is one of the main, like, counter arguments to the composable tech stack. Is like, yes. there, there is a ton of tech debt that could come with this idea of managing, like, 17, 25, 30 plus different tools as you scale the company. And like, unfortunately, sometimes you could get close to building, like, that, that front end stack. And when there's something that breaks and there's, like, an issue somewhere, you don't have just the one platform to like diagnose. You have like 30 plus different endpoints and you need to troubleshoot and all of those things. So nah, you're kind of like explaining this UI on top of like building a composable stack where you would utilize AI to help you pick and choose the solutions that you yep. need instead of like having to do business with like all these different vendors. You're kind of like focusing on the, the top layer of UI, I guess. Like, am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I would think that an organization would only sort of have to configure their own um, UI in space for, you know, what works best for their organization. They know their product, they know the way that their customer buys their product, et cetera. Um, and, uh, you know, you could even go as far as sort of getting a, a marketplace where the gen and AI sort of figures out, hey, which is actually the best feature vendor for, for the question I'm getting asked and, uh, hey, which one actually integrates the best with the solutions I currently have, you know, and, and sort of really sort of plug and playing, but that's sort of the AI future, which will come around or probably, you know, five years or 10 years. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But what you do see is that an organization needs to be mature enough to handle that. And I've seen plenty of organizations who have never heard of marketing operations, who, where everything <laughs> is done by IT and still by IT, and they don't have the organizational maturity yet to yeah. go into, you know, managing multiple integrations for their solution. And, and in those cases, suites are still the best. So you'll still see suites run very well and sell very well for the organization with a low maturity in the marketing, in, you know, how data savvy they are, how data driven they're working. Uh, and, and that's just the reality. Yeah. And yeah, no, unfortunately, you know, while we're talking about this, we know that we see a lot of like very agile companies in the news, but you no, know, we only see like one or two percent, and, yeah. and all the others, there's <laughs> like a slew of the oil tankers or mammoths, as we used to call them, that are <laughs> yeah. incredibly big. You know, they're hard to fail, um, and they'll just keep on trucking. <laughs> they'll keep on trucking, and they'll keep on going because they're just core to to our lives, you know, the insurance, the uh, logistics, the, the trains, the, the postage. I've seen all of these in, they're trying to innovate, but they don't have the culture. They don't have the people part because people go to those hip and cool companies, you know, the startups, et cetera. So who sticks around at the older companies? Yeah, no, it's such a good point. Like it's, it's easy for us to talk about the future of AI yeah, and MarTech and composable stacks, but like 90% of the world is still just trying to figure out what the hell the CDP is and how do I get IT to get their hands out of my marketing yeah. tools. Just well, what, what is marketing ops? Isn't that just marketing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we're, we're not going down that rabbit hole here. I want to I wanna pivot back to project management. So sure. I, I promise at the top of the show that I'd play the, the grumpy devil's advocate here. So I'm going to let my, my grumpiness out a little bit. So um, like... Project management, process, elements, like I'm a marketing ops guy. So like I'm a fan yeah. of it, but just to play devil's advocate, like too often the trigger for me in my career for implementing new project management processes, whether it's lean or agile, it 
hasn't been to improve how do we work or how do we collaborate better. It's mainly been so leaders can get a report of who is doing what and mm. they can see who's doing more work, who's doing less work. What are your thoughts here? Like how, how would you react if a CMO hired you to implement a new process or a new lean methodology and the goal for her or him was basically just to be able to track task completions or just like, I don't see yeah. what my team is doing. Like who's doing what? I want a project management tool and a new process so I know who's doing what. That, that usually comes from people who have, um, were not as much leaders, they're micromanagers. Yeah. That's the way it sounds like, right? This is micromanagement that you're doing. Yeah. Um, no, so in, in these cases, I would always say that, look, um, you have sort of the current baseline and you also have sort of the growth that people are showing. And we're trying to apply lean. It, it's, it's called, you know, one of the pillars is called people and, and we transfer it to, you know, enabling people to continuously, you know, improve. So it's not necessarily what their current rate KPI is, because you know, if I'm going to be honest and I'm looking in, into your organization, I will probably see that your KPI is quite bad, but you're setting a certain target KPI and you're trying to progress your growth in, you know, coming closer and closer to that KPI, you know, all the, in, in a couple of months times or a half year, depending on. So whenever you, you, every organization that started as a scale up and, and has grown into an enterprise has their own processes, right? They, they've started somewhere and it's sort of, you know, what, what the KPI is and where you currently are to see that you've achieved it. Then you'll be like, Hey, what if we could actually go higher and, and okay, then what would, what would require us to go higher? So every time it's you're improving the foundation, you're improving the process, you're improving the collaboration, you're improving you know, your employees and how your employees function, because it's a very big part of your organization. And a fair culture where people are like, hey, all well, your KPI is down, uh, you know, you're on a pit and, and if you don't <laughs> progress well, you're, 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 you're tossed off in, in two months and, and good luck. Um, that, that works in the US, it, it works a little harder in the Netherlands where, you know, you have sort of like a, a it's very hard to kick someone out unless you're doing a reorganization. So I know this is a US problem, not necessarily a European problem. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing. You're trying to continuously improve the organization, the processes. And if you only look at you know, the, the one moment in time, which is now, you won't, you'll miss, you won't look at, okay, but what happened two months later or what happened two months ago? If you don't look at that context, you don't see, hey, which direction could we actually go? I mean, and even someone who isn't very good or isn't like the, the, the immediate star, I mean, you also have a lot of toxic stars in, in sales. I, I've seen a lot of those. Um, they ruin things for the rest of the team. Mm. So one person can deteriorate a team and by removing them, you could actually, you know, uplift a team and you would see things like that if you look at continuously improving and asking people, hey, what do you need from us to, you know, get better or become better. How can, how can we improve your process, the collaboration, the tools, you know, or do we need massage, share massage or whatever? What is it? Yeah. We have a few great days planned and we cannot wait to dive in. The vision is to set the standards for what it means to be in marketing operations. What we're doing in this conference we're actually shaping the future of our profession. There's such an opportunity here. It's all of you who are gonna be the leaders making that real. What we need to do is focus on data analysis, research. Well, how do you think about like this idea of the balance between doing the work versus planning the work? Like, especially in startups, like, which is like most of my experience, like we just need to get shit done. Like nine yeah. out of 10 startups don't survive. Like we don't have the luxury to spend 12 months figuring out this new process to plan work. Like th there's no time for daily scrums and Asana project boards and Gantt charts. Like but we could have shipped three campaigns by the time the project manager found a convenient synchronous time to do a project kickoff. Like how do you strike a uh, balance between sticking to process 
and just like rolling up your sleeves to get shit done in these like fast paced environments. <laughs> well, it's, it's as I say in, in RevOps, I, I did the HubSpot, uh, the HubSpot certification and uh, there was this really nice quote. I think it was from Doug. Um, he said, you can go fast, but you won't go far if you go in the wrong direction, right? You can have speed, but you won't necessarily have velocity. And if you're just focusing on constantly executing quickly without a process, I mean, you might end up solving the wrong solution or the wrong problem, or you might create inefficiencies down the road, which is what we see in a, in a lot of startups, right? We've seen that through the growth at all costs that was really hip until 2022, you know, companies just threw money at their go-to-market and, and they, they grew, you know, incredibly large. And now we look at them and we see, hey, you're actually paying like four times uh, uh, what you should for acquiring, you know, every single dollar. You're, you're paying four times as much. And that's from all these inefficiencies that are sort of built up over, over the years often. So there's a fine balance in between, you know, uh, working the process and getting shit done because of course at the end of the day you get shit done. Um, so I would definitely recommend to at least do a 15 minute check-in, stand up, whatever you want to call it with your team, talk about a, how are our targets, what are our blockers in getting those KPIs back up and you only need 15 minutes and in that, those 15 minutes you can already you know, get a lot of, you know, you can talk about your targets and goals about the processes, what's going well, what's going wrong, um, where do I need help in sort of escalating or dealing with a certain blocker or a certain individual that, that's harassing us or, you know, whatever it could be. You know, I have VP that, that's constantly asking for more features because, oh yeah, we already have a backlog. That's, that's the length of uh, a very, very, very long uh, receipt from, from Target or, or uh, Walmart. Um, to sort of translate it to, to, to the U.S. audience. No, and um, like minimally have like a Kanban board for the bigger things where you can tr track, okay, how are things progressing? And if we see certain things sort of really stick around for a long time, like we know that they're blocked. We know that it's not optimized. And we sort of check in and then sort of we do, do a Kanban, okay, how can we improve that session? But you don't need to, like, like force everything into a process. That's, that's what I saw in, in Agile and in Scrum and in Safe is very forced. And I've seen one of those in action, like a, in a safe transition. It, it was, it was, everyone was sort of stumped in, in trying to figure out, Hey, uh, is this like, do we do it in this way? Do we do it in this way? And you've got constant conversations and it just slows down the entire organization. So indeed, especially in startups, like, like look at them, the leanest way of, you know, using tools and the methodology to get where you need to go, which is you know, improving it without sort of taking away all the time working, you know, in, in your core job, doing the deep work, you know, throwing those campaigns or getting those leads in. Yeah, it's, it's a balance. I don't want to say it depends, but there's a balance. Yeah. 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 No, I personally actually don't love the, we can go fast, but we can go far if you, we, we can't go far if we go in the wrong direction. Like yeah. that, that adage, like it assumes that all processes and everything RevOps does like results in determining the right direction. Like in the real oh, world, it's just not true. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> like it's not, I, I get it's not. like alignment matters for sure. Like it, it, like that's the whole goal of like scrums and like, you know, sometimes like someone says, Oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm working on this and you had no idea and you're also working on that. And then you can kind of align it. Uh, but like the fastest way to know if we're on the right track in my startup experience is to just ship and get feedback right away and fast yeah. and i can't do that if i'm stuck in like all of these scrum meetings that are just like theoretical and so political and we're talking about like what is someone's personal opinion about what the direction we should go like can i just like go back to work and do actual <laughs> shit but like how do you balance this idea of like when you kind of talked about this already but like when process gets in the way of efficiency like how do you balance process for the sake of process i've worked for some leaders and vps that you you kind of described already who've like tried to implement lean or agile workflows and tools to much resistance <laughs> myself yeah. included like because shit wasn't broken in the first place and tech just added overhead and slowed people down like how do you strike that balance it so again it, it might be from someone who is uh, 
oh yeah, I'm a, I've been a black belt for every year and every new organization I go into, I, I throw in my black belt and I ensure that everyone's lean, focused, and uh, everyone will be happy. And, you know, a, a chain, implementing something like lean or safe or, or agile, it takes years. It's a cultural change. And if there's one thing I know from, from digital strategy and, and working with large enterprises, as soon as you're start to change processes and, you know, it gets worse by changing tools as well, or changing people as well. It just slugs down because it's like a cultural change that you're trying yeah, to yeah. enable. So you need to do change management and that is lengthy. Um, so, you know, again, you sort of start with, you know, smaller issues, you start small and it, as you go and you share the learnings that you've done. And if you, 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 you show a team that's really good, you start with a team that, that is really willing and able, or that sees the vision, start with them, start small, share winning, share learnings across the entire organization and have them as your ambassador, sort of like, and then just roll it out as you go, not go like, like full hundred percent in from the get-go, because that does not work unless you've got an incredible lengthy cultural change and, and all kinds of workshops, or you've got a CEO that says, yeah, we have to do it tomorrow. So we're going to do it tomorrow. And if, if anyone who doesn't follow me, you know, there's a door. <laughs> uh, yeah. You need to do this as, um, you need to do this agile. Basically mm -hmm. I'm, I'm calling it now. So if you want to do something like lean or agile, you need to do it agile. You need to Jeez. iterate small and, and start small with small iterations and sort of see what works and what does work, what adds value, what detracts from the value. And then as you go, you can sort of like, you know, continue to dive deeper into, into this well of information that is lean or that is agile or, or safe and sort of pick and choose what you feel, hey, this is actually what we need right now. Let's try it, implement it, and see if it works or not. That's at least my view, especially for smaller lean or smaller startups, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, no, it's very meta advice. Like oh. if you want to try <laughs> agile, be agile about implementing agile, but it makes a ton of sense yeah, right? because, you know, be, there's like a shock factor to it. Like one of my personal gripes with process and agile specifically is that it often hinders flexibility and like suffocates creative freedom almost, right? Like take a person who like me right now, like has very little to no meetings on my calendar. I set my own hours. I build my own schedule. I'm able to be creative during my optimal flow states, but put me in a corporate environment with 15 daily scrum meetings, Asana task review meetings, project kickoffs, and having to manually update projects and give updates to a bunch of people all the time. Like, I, I get that often we work for businesses and we need accountability in a certain like shape. But how do we balance that with without like suffocating flexibility and, and creative freedom? Yeah, don't forget about having to be online on on. 10 different communication tools and then constantly have to respond <laughs> yeah. to an email or a Slack <laughs> message, even within a certain amount of time, because otherwise people are like, oh, you're, you're, you're not communicative or, you know, I tried to get this across. You didn't read my email chain of, of 10 yeah. emails. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, companies need to realize that people require deep work time to get things done. You know, especially when you're in development, creative, strategic roles, you need to you need to sort of be able to sort of just stare at a wall for like two hours and try and figure out, okay, what, what's the solution? I'm trying to grasp it without someone picking you or calling you with, hey, where, where are my GPS reports? You know, those kinds of things, <laughs> they're needed to get work done. Um, you take it away from them and they won't, they will become less efficient. They won't be able to reach their KPIs. They won't be able to reach their goals. I mean, that's something that I hope you, know, you get in, the, in those standups. You know, if I could get some less calls or if I could get some you know, deep work time in my agenda, that would actually help me. And then you can sort of try and implement that. So, um, and, and same goes for meetings, right? There are a slew of inefficient meetings that are way too long that people sort of start chatting the first 15 minutes or just catch up. <laughs> yeah, small talk. That's, that's coffee talk, right? Get out of here. <laughs> um, with people present that have no opinion or no added value into the meeting, they're like, yeah, what am I even doing here? I can say one line that, that could have been a Slack message basically. Yeah. Um, or without any input, um, you know, 
people should be prepared. So there should be an agenda present. There should only be the people that are having some added value. Uh, and the goal of the meeting should be clearly stated at, at, at the beginning, right? In this meeting, we're trying to accomplish this, this, this. Then the meeting is success. Uh, this is the agenda. Everyone has seen it before. I mean, everything that you need to read beforehand, you've got it. So that people can go into the meeting and be like, you know, when they're talking about their KPIs or the dashboard, they're not like, oh, what's this? What's, what's this, that number over there? Oh, we, oh, we don't recognize this data. Now, everyone's prepared and everyone has agreed beforehand that this is a dashboard that we're going to be discussing. You know, if you have any problems with it, email us beforehand. You, you get the agenda like at least a day or two beforehand so you can sort of add it to agenda if you need it to be. And that's it. And how, how simple this is, like, like a lot of things, how simple this is, it is so hard for people to do it. I have no idea why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, it's, it's, it's easy to say. And then like, you know, yeah, people do it for a little bit and then you go to the next meeting and it slowly erodes back to yeah. what it was before. And yeah, I, I want to, you, you made a good transition there to like the back to the data component and like the measurement context of, of lean here. Like at the top of the show, you mentioned web traffic and social media followers as examples of like the wrong things when measuring marketing. And mm. even if we agree that like ultimately driving growth and revenue and like qualified leads is the main goal of marketing and sales, I think we can make an argument for leading and lagging indicators when it comes to KPIs that are worth monitor monitoring. I, I know that you have a big focus on B2B context and like revenue is a lagging indicator at the end of the day. And like, it just doesn't happen right away. The fruits of no. the marketing campaigns that we launch might not ripe for several months, even years, if you're in like the enterprise B2B space. So revenue can't be the only thing that we track and we measure marketing by. And so like immediate bumps in followers on social or spikes in traffic, like those are leading indicators. They are mm -hmm. like a bit fluffy for sure, but like they shouldn't be the only thing you track. But with the absence of being able to show like immediate revenue, like isn't that kind of okay? Curious your thoughts there. Now you're putting me at the spot here, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, I agree to a certain point that, um, yeah, you need those leading indicators to have sort of like your early idea of, hey, this is a success or, or a less of success. But if you don't, like, like, if you don't do a cohort study of figuring out, hey, these leading, you know, we, we're trying a, a couple of different campaigns and we're trying to follow them across the entire, um, you know, the revenue chain to figure out, hey, how loyal are these customers next year or not? Why has changed? And then based on that, you can sort of, you know, go back and sort of, hey, these leading indicators were actually indicative of something right. later down the line. You want to try and find causation in that, not just like a coincidental correlation mm -hmm. um, as, as you can sometimes find in these situations. Do I have another opinion on this? I'm, I'm really trying hard to, to figure out. So, so one thing that I, I have noticed is that leading indicators can sometimes be really misused by departments in saying that, hey, how well have we been doing this year, for instance? And then their department lead might you know, move into another organization or another department next year over. And you see, you know, in the end, but, but all those leading indicators were very well. What, what happened to the results, the revenue, the people? And, you know, it might have just been a, a way to do something short term that's really effective and in the long term or detrimental to the brand, for instance, right? You can do a very big campaign blast. You get, hey, we've got so many people coming in, at least to the website from a campaign. And then one year later, uh, you see that your open rate or that, that you, you just get thrown into the spam box folder because you've been doing shotgun marketing the previous couple of months. So. Yes, leading indicators are okay, but with context, with mm -hmm. the, the longer context and still, you know, especially with the, with the amount of spam coming up right now, uh, from AI and gen AI, um, like a good customer experience is, is I think the best indicator. If you can get, um, like be, be branded for that you do so well in your customer experience that your product is, you know, good. Of course you need to have a good product, but that marketing sales and customer success are on point, which for a lot of companies is not the case, yeah. you know, especially customer success and, and adoption of tools. 
if you don't do those things well across the entire journey, then people will be like, yeah, Salesforce is very good at the, the sales side, but then actually following up, you, you're figuring out well, what the hell am I actually paying for? What, what, what is this mess? Or, and and I, I'm saying Salesforce, but there are many of our other companies mm -hmm. that have the exact same situation. They're incredibly sales oriented, but as soon as things get, you know, they're shifted over, toss over to customer success, it sort of just all pulls apart because for a lot of enterprise, a lot of scale-ups, especially customer success is not a, um, a very interesting or very, very revenue driving theme. It's seen as a cost post. It's, you know, there's a lot to unpack there as well, uh, in terms of, you know, that some of them should just partner with consultancies or agencies to sort of pick that up. But that's, that's a whole different podcast that we could go in there, Phil. <laughs> is that the direction you want to take? Uh, or are we going down that rabbit hole or should we sort of pivot back? Uh, yeah, you said something really interesting at the top of your answer, which was around causation. And I want to take a pit stop there because, um, like, obviously reporting on bad metrics seems to be a main yeah. theme and your kind of a explanation for lean. Um, but I want to take a short stop with attribution because... Uh, I think the question of how do we measure marketing's impact is very important and central to like the whole theme of lean methodology. Um, I've had conversations with different folks on the show recently about multi-touch attribution versus incrementality and true causation. And one of the things that resonates the most with me with some of those conversations is that MTA, multi-touch attribution, does nothing to tell you what truly caused a conversion or revenue. MTA simply shows you, and it's really good at that, the visible path to conversion, yeah. but not the cause of conversion. Do you agree that MTA is still useful, but most of us are just using it wrong? And, sure. and what's your recommended approach for measuring what marketing campaigns truly caused a, an increase in revenue? Yeah. I would, I mean, for every organization or marketing department that I enter, I would ask, hey, what is your self-reported what, what do clients self-report in terms of, hey, this campaign converted me, or this is how I learned about your organization? You'll, you'll find it. It's not Google search or, or Google. I mean, they, it went to Google because, you know, they were looking for your company name or they were looking for your, your niche. Um, but you'll see that a lot of that happens in what they call, what they call dark social. Um, you know, the, what, what we're doing in, in the different communities, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer networks, um, we're talking with colleagues, we're talking with ex-colleagues, we're talking with people in our network, we're asking, hey, you know, what tools should I use for X and Y? And why is it better than the other one? You know, that, that's, that's very big on their marketing. Um, so in terms of um, the attribution and the causation, I would take with, with, a, with a, well, not a pinch of salt, I would take with a bucket of salt <laughs> because I would rather listen to what the customer has to say directly that they remember us from, then sort of try and figure out, hey, w which one actually along the customer journey was as optimized as possible. I mean, I'm very much in, in favor of doing like good customer journey orchestration across your website and sort of figure out, I, I know there's a company that was really good. It was called um, Thunderhead. Uh, they had this, this commercial, I, I, I'll never forget it with the Viking bear with incredibly big nipples. Um, it, it, <laughs> Watch the video, watch, <laughs> it, it, it's, it blew me away like 10 years ago. I was like, what the hell is this? But they did very well in the marketing, I feel. So they would give, they would give salespeople a teat to suck on sort of to get their information that, that, that was sort of the joke of it. But what they, what they showed was on your website, where do customers sort of drop off? Where do they go? What's their journey across your content? And that I feel is interesting. So to figure out, hey, what for our specific customers, you know, what, what different type of segments do we get and what type of content are they willing to consume or consuming over a longer period of time? There's a concept that I'm, I'm really loving, which is called um, the marketing waiting room by, by Justy. And um, what she basically shows is, you know, we know that only three to 5% of customers are in market to buy today. All the others, you know, they might not be problem aware. They might not be, you know, uh, pain aware. They might not be in, in market right now or they have, you know, 10 other different priorities. But 
by ensuring that they are in this, this marketing room, we are constantly sort of feeding them like interesting tidbits about your product, about your solution, about the pain, you know, top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, you know, the entire, uh, 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 funnel. And the way that customers sort of progress through that, you can sort of figure out, Hey, this one is actually, you know, progressing towards someone who's incredibly interesting because their consumption rate has increased. Those types of analytics, I'm very much in favor of, and, and those ones I'm getting very enthusiastic about, but the regular attribution of, yeah, did they come through social or LinkedIn or, or whatnot, I'm like, doubtful, doubtful it is that good. I would, like I mentioned, I would much rather listen to what a customer, consumer, whatever it is, say themselves about, hey, this is what actually converted me to go for your product or go for your service or whatnot. Yeah, I feel like we could follow up with a, a whole other podcast on uh, on the validity <laughs> of, of self-reported attribution and how I'm free in a couple of have... months, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I got two last questions for you, uh, Rigger. Um, I, sure. I think you'd agree that, so la last thing on, on this topic of, of data tracking and, and attribution, like most companies track all of the things and well, at least tech companies, like may maybe not the 90% the of other industries where, <laughs> which we talked about earlier, but in tech, yeah. like most of these companies track all of the things and they throw it in like a data warehouse or CEP, regardless of like existing or future needs for that data. And I think lean concepts applies beautifully to this trend of data minimization that I've chatted with a couple of folks on the show, like thinking mindfully about what data you really need and only tracking that. What advice do you have for teams for balancing, like only tracking what they really need today, but also thinking about like five, 10 years down the line and the data they might need in the future? Yeah. So five to 10 years is, is quite long, right? Yeah. We know that we can sort of, we, we overestimate what happens within, oh, sorry, we underestimate what happens within two years and we yeah. overestimate what happens within five to 10. Um, through all kinds of reasons, culture also being the biggest ones that people are slow to adopt, whatever it is. So in terms of, you know, being lean about your data, um, I completely agree that you have to be mindful and strategic about, hey, what what are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to accomplish as an organization? What's the strategy for the next coming five years? And you know, what will the market look like the next five years? What are we expecting of inside and outside forces? And then using that as a guide path. Okay, so what kind of data should we collect to you know engage on that or pivot on that? Um, and one thing that we need to we one thing that we really need to consider is that. In five to 10 years, we not, might not be talking to people anymore. We'll be talking to their personal agents. We'll be talking to their, uh, whatever it is. It, it, everyone will have like this little AI chatbot in their phone, uh, on their emails, on their WhatsApp, on their LinkedIn, giving them a personal feed to ensure that you know, you're not content tired from all those family folders, which we're, we're getting, you know, every single year. I mean, my, my inbox is filled with newsletters. Some of them I love to read and the others I, I, I'm like, yeah, I, I, I probably read it, but I'm, I'm forgetting it. And then there's, there's 10 other ones that are sort of picking my attention. So we'll see these agents in everyone's little pocket. And, you know, as a brand, you would need to talk to that agent and you would need to sort of somehow prove to the agent that you're important enough that you're. Um, you know, you, you connect with the owner on a intimate level, uh, you know them extremely well, and, and that's not just a personalization of, hey, I know you work at X or Y, and I know you're this old, and, and you know, the, the shitty personalization that they're typically getting, and they're saying, oh, yeah, that's personalization, right? <laughs> no, it's that you're really, uh, it goes deeper than that. You know, I, I know your family values, or I know your values in your mm -hmm. organization, or I know your personal values. I know that, you know, okay, it's, it's worth your cats. He, he loves lean, so I've got a, a very... I pitched a, a story about lean and, and how it's really shitty. So read it and, and learn how, how it's, how you can improve your consultancy or whatnot, you know, something that personalized and then, you know, to convince the AI to get through that sort of firewall you have, everyone yeah. will have a little content firewall. Maybe hmm. that's the way to call it a content firewall in your pocket. Um, I'll pitch it. I'll post a LinkedIn post about it today. <laughs> nice. No. And, and that's the thing. Um, and beyond that, I think that for an organization to get shortlisted, you need to show that you are trustworthy. 
that you are a fun and interesting brand to follow. There are not many newsletters I read, but there's one individual called Lessa, and her newsletter is a mess and it's a funny mess. I read it because it's a funny mess. Nothing else. Not, not because it might be educational, because I like it as a funny mess. That's why I read it. She has cows in her newsletter. Very cool. Yeah, no, that's a, a really interesting topic, like a AI content firewall in your pocket and having to chat with AI agents. Um, yeah, there's there's maybe like a couple other podcast episodes to, to do on this record. This has been super <laughs> fun. Uh, one last question for you. Uh, we asked this question to everyone on the show. You're a business owner. You're also a GTM operations consultant. You're also a dad of two kids and you're a big green egg master chef as well as we chatted before we hit record. Um, how do you remain happy and successful in your career? Like, how do you find balance between all these things you're working on while staying happy? Yeah. So for me, I've learned that my happiness comes from working with the right people, the people that I, I vibe with, so to say. And early on, I've worked under a couple of bad managers and it really drained my energy. Um, so now, especially thanks to networking, I found a lot of people that I truly enjoy collaborating with where there's some back and forth of value, you know, exchange. And that has made all the difference, at least for me. Um, as well, you know, working for myself, it gives me a lot of flexibility, you know, to spend time with my daughters, do barbecuing, going on, you know, take my weekend on a Wednesday instead of like Saturday and Sunday. Um, but I know it's, you know, being an entrepreneur is not for everyone. Some of them are trapped by choice or, you know, by accident in working into an enterprise, right? So um, I would advise everyone to network more and more. You know, I only started last year to really do it. And that has given me a job, a lot of interesting friends, and it gave me courage to start my own company and this podcast. So I think that especially with, you know, Gen AI, people will need to start investing in their personal brand as well for authenticity and trust to rise above that Gen AI generated crap and sort of leverage their brand in such a way that, you know, if you want to start for yourself and if you want to find, you know, your, your crew, your, your people that you vibe with, you know, it helps to have a personal brand to be outspoken about, you know, who you are, what you like, what you dislike, um, and leverage that to your success. That is what I would, yeah, make, tell everyone to sort of be happy, invest in yourself and your network because it's way more impactful than than you you currently think it will be Very even cool. if it's love. on linkedin <laughs> <laughs> love that answer i'll uh i'll look forward to the the post about uh ai firewall for for content um regular it's yeah. been super fun conversation really appreciate you uh sharing some of your insights um i feel like you have at least given me optimism about lean methodologies and and, and rethinking right. some of my my grumpy uh point of views on on process there but uh thank you for uh, humoring us today it's been super fun it was super fun phil it was really really a fun podcast to do. thank you cheers man 